Okay, it's time to start. I want to, uh, what's going on? <laughs> Let me in on the joke, I like to laugh. <laughs> um, I wanted to just say a couple more things about the kinetic theory, uh, which will be relevant to our discussion. Namely, uh, let's see, here we are keeping, uh, pressure is the variable. Let's say if I increase the temperature here. Um, ah, this is an interesting thing. This is nice to see. Can you, can you all see that I should turn the light out? Let's turn the light out. Is that any clear? Is better? Maybe two? Uh, no, just things you, sh you should know about um, the way uh, the kinetic theory works, which you probably know, you should know. It's really a very basic, important idea in physics, uh, and it applies to a lot of things. Namely, uh, what is pressure? The pressure of a gas? It has to do with the bombardment of a surface by the molecules in the gas. If they bump against the surface, they uh, increase. I could put in more gas in here just to make it a little more vivid, perhaps. Put in a little more helium. I haven't changed the, the speeds at all, but I put in a lot more. So you can see that they're sort of bumping against the piston here, and that's what's exerting the pressure on, on the piston. Um, now, if I, so that's one thing. That's what pressure is. It's just the bumping of the molecules against the surface, which you surely know. Now, th the temperature here is quite low, as low as I can get at 25 Kelvin in this animation. As I increase the temperature, oh, one thing you want to see. One of the molecules has been marked. Uh, I can follow it with a tracking gear. Which guy? Uh, this one here, now I found him. See how he's being jostled? He bumps a wall, he, he, then a molecule hits him, and so on. Each time he's accelerated, he gives uh, off a little bit of light, because what happens is that the electronic structure of the molecule is disturbed. He's a cloud of electrons, and he's got a positive, just be careful of the wire. Thank you. <laughs> um, um, it's being disturbed, so there's a shock, and you're creating a little dipole, you're, you're jostling the electron, and if you create a dipole, it will radiate during the time that it's accelerating, and so all these little motions cause these things to radiate, and because you're at a low temperature, the guy's not moving very fast. Here he is, you see, in this animation, they're actually following this color, this colored guy, you know, he's jiggling around. See, right now his velocity is low, but suddenly his velocity is high, so he goes through a whole range of velocities. His average velocity is this one, but he can have, an occasion, quite high velocity. Let me see, here there's pretty, he's above average, sort of like a distribution, like the rest of us, the distribution, some of us are above average, except in like Wobegon, where everybody's above average, you know that joke. You ever listen to um, Giller? He comes from like Wobegon, where everybody, all the children are above average. What can we do? <laughs> It's a little bit of a joke. But anyhow, uh, uh, we like to think that we're above average. We're all above average. But, so this guy is sometimes below average, and sometimes he's above average in, in speed. He's being jostled around. That's important, because you'll see that later on, we're going to have energy levels. And the energy levels are going to be bombarded by this thermal energy, whose average is about here. On the other hand, occasionally, the, the, you, you'll get a particle that comes along and has above average energy. And he can actually cause a jump from one quantum level to another, despite the fact that the average is too low. On occasion, uh, a jostling will occur that knocks the uh, state from a, from a quantum level. We'll see something like this, like, where my average kinetic energy, kT, that's the average. That's an, an average. Uh, but every once in a while, there's, a, there's a, an extra, extra energetic particle, which can, although kT is not enough on the average, every once in a while, there's an occasional jostle to here. But it doesn't happen that often. In fact, it's, it's sort of, there's actually kind of an exponential uh, uh, occasion where the, uh, the speed will be um, high enough to actually uh, cause you to go over. Now, you see, on the average, you're over here, and, and things were uh, occasionally have reasonably high energy. If I increase the temperature, however, I speed up everybody. The half mv squared goes up. Here, it's going up. And you see that picking up speed, of about, uh, we're at roughly room temperature about 300 Kelvin. 273 being minus 273 is the uh, absolute zero, minus 273, and we're at roughly 30 Kelvin. And you can see, look what's going on here. These guys are getting jostled, and the pressure has increased because they, uh, they're hitting here more and more rapidly, and the um, uh, jostling and the hitting is going on much more rapidly. And, and occasionally, again, the average has gone up, and occasionally there's this fellow, oh, he's been here average, he's above average now for a while, and then he's above average, you see? So, what you have to realize is it's, it's a statistical thing that's going on here. There's an average, but there are energies that are in these molecules below average, and those above average. So I just wanted to point that out to you, because we'll be using that idea of an average energy, kT, which is mo models sort of the center of this distribution, but you, you have some probability of less, uh, uh, less energy and some probability of energy. So that's not, not too surprising, but I just wanted to point that out. Um, and the, uh, so let's go over to this other um, demo that I, or animation that I showed you, and that is if you have an object at a temperature, and we pick a simple system we'll called the black body, which I showed you this box uh, the last time with, with a hole in it, and the hole is black in here. Now, the reason it's called a black body is that a thing is black if it absorbs all the light that comes into it. If you have white light coming in and nothing coming out, it will look black. Like if I turn the lights out in this room, there's no light, and so we say the room is dark or black. So that's what it really means. And the reason we build a, a box like this is that if light goes into this box, it won't get out right away. It's going to wrap around inside, and pretty soon it's going to be absorbed, and it, the light will come to the temperature of the box. Which right now, the temperature of that light is pretty high, basically. It's sort of like sunlight. Sunlight was created at around 5,000 Kelvin, or 6,000, something like that. The white light is, in, is produced by a very hot object. So the white light that goes in there is very much, in a sense, hotter than, than the actual box, which is more like 300 Kelvin. So what's going to happen? It's going to thermalize. If you let it go in here, the white light will pick around, and it's going to come down from being sort of 6,000 Kelvin. So I can show you that again by simply raising the temperature of this black box. See, if I, here's the temperature going up, 1,700. See, if I get it up to the temperature of the sun, about 5 to 6,000, the surface of the sun, you see where it's the color is characterized by the spectrum, very much in the visible, as we said. So that's the temperature of a hot 6,000 degree object. Um, uh, 300 Kelvin one uh, has a very different spectrum. And uh, we get that by taking this bright light, this yellow and blue and stuff, high frequency light, put it in the box, let it kick around, don't let it get out. Take a small hole, and then it will eventually thermalize. And what will come out, we put, so it's black to this, the white light does not get out of here. But what will come out is the long wavelength 300 Kelvin um, radiation that's come out of the box, and that's the radiation that's coming out of us. 
because we're, the molecules in us are jostling around rather slowly, the molecules in the sun, the atoms are jostling very much faster. So the things you, you want to see about this, there's two things that you really should know about the black body as far as formulas go. One is sort of the total amount of radiation that's coming out, which um, you see energy density in joules uh, times seconds, that's energy, energy per square meter. Joules per, that's, well, that's per cubic meter, actually. So that's, that's the total energy density. And the number up here is around 60 times 10 to the 12th. So that's a huge energy density, which is the light which would come out of a 6,000 degree object, or 6,500 Kelvin. OK, but if I lower the temperature, things change quite a bit. Let's say, let's say I was about 5,000. Let me go down to 2,500, half as much. Out in here. Okay, if before it was 60, now it's more like 1 or 2 times 10 to the 12. So by a factor of 2, I go down by temperature, P, the second temperature, was a half of the initial temperature, and I went from 60 as an energy density to about 1, according to this. Well, that's only the peak. And of course, what I really want to know is the total amount of energy being under this whole curve. But you can see there's a very dramatic drop. And it turns out that the total amount of energy being released is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. So a factor of 2 to the fourth power is 2 times 2 is 4 times 4 is 16 fold at least. So, fact, so in going down a factor of 2, I should go down a factor of 16 or roughly 20. So that's about more or less right. I mean, it was 16. If I go down by 20, it's 30. Uh, if I go 16 divided by 16 or 20, it's about 3. Left here, it's about 2. OK, but what I'm trying to say is that if you look at the total amount of energy being emitted, it goes down steeply with, te with temperature. And that energy emitted, is, this is something you, you should know. It's called the Stefan Boltzmann law, where the total energy under the curve to integrate all the energy under this energy at a certain frequency uh, over all the frequencies, all the wavelengths, the total energy uh, integral of all the energy at a certain frequency times frequency is proportional to sigma a constant times t to the fourth. So that's how much things radiate. And they radiate a lot more as you go up in, the te in temperature. Uh, the other feature that you, you have to know, really, is the key idea of the, this again is a black body, which is this very simple system. What's happening also is the peak here moves as you increase or decrease temperature. Let's say I decrease the temperature a little bit. See, the peak is moving toward longer wavelengths as I go down in temperature. So that's the one rule. And the other rule is called the Beams Law. And that is that the, the, um, the wavelength where the maximum energy is uh, is inversely proportional to the temperature. As, as the temperature goes up, the wavelength will go down where that maximum is. It's lambda at the maximum is what I mean here. Or it's sometimes written lambda max t is a constant, which is just saying that if you make a thing hotter, the wavelength where the peak is goes down, meaning the thing will go from red to blue. As I make the thing hotter, it'll go from red hot to sort of blue hot, which is what, what this demo is, is showing you also. Namely, as I make it hotter, as I make it hotter, you'll see there'll be more blue. I'm going to move towards blue as I make it hotter. And if I make it even hotter and hotter, 7,000, see, I keep moving. And the, the mathematical relation is, is that, so-called Beam's Law. Those are the two things you, you should take, take away from a black body thing. Um, and it's kind of like, you know, a blacksmith knows this kind of thing. He can tell roughly how hot a thing is by looking at its color, how hot it is it's going to radiate. OK? So those, I think, are the key things. Now, yes, ma'am? Yeah, more blue, yes. You see, you see how it, as hotter, it's not 8,000 here. Uh, there's a lot of blue. In fact, it's peaking in the blue. And it's shifted so far to the blue that it isn't, um, it's even more blue than, than red right now. But um, I notice how the, the intensity has gone up. It's now 400, and I've gone up uh, from 5,000 roughly to, to um, 8,000. So the intensity under this curve has gone up as well, and it's shifted toward the blue. Let's, shall we go down in temperature and see how, how the peak shifts toward the red as we go down in temperature? It's shifting to the right, and the red is a longer wavelength, so the thing will look redder if it's cooler. If it's hotter, it'll look bluer. Um, now, th th as I say, most blacksmiths since 200 years ago would, would have known this. These precise measurements were only done at the end of the 19th century, around 1890, precise measurements of this shape of this curve. And then the physicists sat down and, and tried to understand why is this happening. It turns out they couldn't understand it. Strangely enough, it seems pretty obvious. But it turned out to be a hard problem. Just to explain this very simple experiment. I have a box. I have a, I keep it at a certain temperature. And I, and I measure the light that, that comes out of the hole. How do you do it? Well, probably like you did in the lab. And this, this I think, is actually in interesting how they probably did this. I have to look it up exactly how they did it. But I would think that what they did, they had a diffraction gradient, like you would use in the lab. And they spread the colors out so that they get this whole spectrum of colors. And then they probably put, like, thermometers at various places just to measure how much energy, say, is coming out in the yellow and how much is coming out uh, in the, let's see, n lambda, the d sine theta. So it's small angles and small wavelengths. So if that's yellow, the red would be over here and blue would be over here. So you can spread the light out into its spectrum. And basically, I think what they would do is put a thermometer there and just measure the energy flow at that color. And you build up this curve. And they measure it. You know, how much red? So in fact, you see, because they're measuring wavelength, because they know the number of lines per inch, so you know the d-spacing, which is uh, the number, one over the number of lines per inch. So you can tell what the wavelength is. And then you just plot the energy coming out of there as a function of wavelength. And that's that curve. And then you can vary the temperature. And if you make it hotter, it'll get, the wavelength will get shorter. Something like that. And the curve will get bigger. So this could be at a higher temperature. And so that's what they did, I think. So that's what I would have done. I mean, it's a straightforward thing to do. Now, the reason I raise that is that because they did it this way, it would turn out to be a puzzle. Um, because if you do it a little bit differently, the things are less of a puzzle. 
toward the final, at least it's closer to the final answer. Let's just keep those points in mind and go over to uh, some theory. Okay, so now, now we, we have something of an answer to it, why warm things glow, because they're jiggling around, they're bumping off each other, things are accelerating, if you have an accelerating charge, it radiates, and if you keep increase the temperature, you can see where they will radiate more and more frequently, and the pr wavelength frequency will go up as the temperature goes up and all those nice things. Uh, and in fact, we finally get the answer that the um, kinetic energy on the average that I had here before uh, is going to be proportional to the absolute temperature. As I increase the absolute temperature, the kinetic energy on the average will go up. Again, there's this distribution, but there's an average. And that's for each direction of motion. So that's a, a result of this theory. We can also see that um, the, uh, if you look at the gas law, PV equals nRT, something we learned way back when, um, it turns out that PV is also related to the total kinetic energy. So this is a very big clue. It's saying that the temperature is proportional to the kinetic energy, which is, we've been saying it a lot of different ways, but that seems to be true. Okay, um, so there seems to be a connection between energy and temperature. Okay, now we have this curve. And the curve says that as I go up in temperature, the wavelength gets shorter. In other words, in, in, in this way of plotting things, the wavelength at a high temperature is greater than the wavelength at a low temperature. I wish that they had plotted it differently. Suppose they had plotted it this way. Instead of plotting it as a function of wavelength, which is the natural way to do it, if you're using diffraction grading, diffraction grading would tell you the wavelength, as you know. But suppose they had plotted it as a function of frequency. You get a similar curve. You see, the, frequency, the higher frequency is, is at lower wavelength. So you'll get a curve that looks rather similar. At a low temperature, you'll get one curve. At a, at a higher temperature, the curve moves to shorter wavelength, moves to higher frequency. So you get a curve at higher frequency, at higher temperature, that looks like this. Everything will be higher, but the, the peak will move. So the frequency at a high temperature is higher and more higher frequency and higher amplitude than at low temperatures. So this law, the Green law, would be better written that instead of writing it lambda max t, or this thing here, instead of lambda max t, let's write it since lambda is equal to frequency times wavelength equals c, we can substitute for lambda c over the frequency, c over the frequency times t, which is proportional is a con to a constant, or we can write, oh, I'm sorry, that's just c over f. So what we can write is that the, the temperature is proportional to the frequency. We, we should have been able to write something like this. The reason I'm doing this is because we know that the temperature is related to the energy. We said that the temperature is proportional to the average energy. So somehow, energy is related to the frequency directly. That's an insight that Planck had, because you recall that Planck wrote the energy is proportional HF. And th that's what the black body curve is actually telling you if you look at it the right way. Namely, don't look at it in terms of wavelength. Look at it in terms of frequency, and it screams out at you that the energy is proportional to the, the frequency is proportional to energy. That's what, that is what the black body thing is screaming out at you. And it took Planck's insight to actually say that, that we have to relate the energy of a wave to its frequency. <laughs> That's a little bit hard to say. But, um, but I just point that out to you that somehow I think it was because of the way people measure these curves that they plotted it in the way Reen's law. You always written, every book you read, I always have Reen's law, lambda max proportional to one over t. If they plotted it, that frequency max is proportional to t. Then, you, then, then it screams out at you that this is, a, this is proportional to the energy. And so we should associate energy with frequency. So here again, see here's the, on, on the upper curve is the conventional way, in fact, a way plotted in your book and most books that you read, as a function of wavelength. But I have, you know, I was able to find a curve that actually plotted as a function of frequency. And it has the same shape. Um, but the point is that what happens as you increase the temperature, the frequency of the peak moves out. And so it, it just gives you that nice feeling that as I increase the temperature, I'm increasing the frequency of these vibrations. And um, it's, it's, here it is screaming out at you again, that the energy proportional to the frequency is proportional to the temperature. Okay, but, so here's the, the again, takeaway message on black body radiation, namely that the total energy radiated by a black body varies at t, t to the fourth, that's the area under the whole curve, and the wavelength at which it occurs. But as I say, the physics is better revealed if you write that the, the um, frequency of the maximum is proportional to the temperature, where you plot the power emitted by as a function of frequency. It really tells the physics more. So I wanted to explain to you, if I can, uh, why it is that this occurs, and why it was pu a puzzling thing. Because the, the theory up to that point was that every